All right, um, I guess we can start. So um, welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Um, we are really excited to resume the seminar series on data-driven methods in science and engineering. And today's speaker is uh, Professor John Wright, um, Associate Professor in Electrical Engineering at Columbia University. He is also affiliated with the Department of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics um, and Columbia's Data Science Institute. He received his PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of uh, uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2009. And before joining Columbia, he was um, Microsoft uh, Research Asia uh, from 2009 to 2011. His research interests include sparse and low dimensional models for high dimensional data, optimization, convex and otherwise, and applications in imaging and vision. And um, here in our group and in this seminar series, we're really interested in this type of research. So we're really looking forward to your talk. So today, John is uh, going to tell us about um, deep networks and the multiple manifold problem. Uh, John, John, thank you for being with us. And um, please take it away from here. Thanks. OK, great. So uh, Joseph, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone. You know, Nathan and Steve, thank you again for your leadership of the Institute um, and uh, for everyone who's organizing this seminar series. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen screen and we can just make sure that this is showing up. Joseph, does that is that showing up well? Good. Okay, um, great. So it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and you know, thank you everyone for coming to the talk. Um, so as the title of the talk suggests, I'm going to speak a little bit today about some adventures that we've had uh, in trying to wrestle with deep learning, uh, try to understand it a little bit from a mathematical perspective, and then try to use some of those ideas to design different types of learning architectures and learning mechanisms. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk about is uh, joint with uh, actually a bunch of folks. These are um, three of th three major collaborators, uh, Sam Buchanan, Dar Gilboa, and uh, Tingran, Tim Wong. Uh, Tim is one of our AI Institute students, and he's here today. Um, and so Tim is a really great person to talk to uh, if you find yourself interested in what you're hearing here, see some connections. You know, we're um, really excited to, to speak more. Um, so, and, and this is a talk where I really have to thank the students because uh, this work really started with the students. You know, they took me aside about five years ago and said, linear systems of equations are great, convex optimization is great, but we really have to be looking at deep networks. Um, and we really need to figure out, you know, we really need to do something around deep learning. Um, and so for, for myself, um, my personal bias is sort of to think in terms of problem structure and data structure. And so this talk is, um, really going to be an attempt to look into how deep networks interact with structure and data sets. I have a data set in a high dimensional space with some low dimensional structure. I want to know when and how I can fit it well. Um, and this is a topic that I think hopefully is of interest to a lot of folks on the call. You know, I know that Nathan and Steve are, are doing um, really exciting stuff around sort of nonlinear model, model identification with with various, uh, you know, with various various frameworks um, and other folks in the institute. So, you know, the hope is that maybe under the hood here, there are some mathematical tools that could be helpful for thinking about those problems. Maybe some perspectives that we could talk about more. Um, okay, but you know, in any case, uh, title of the talk is "Deep Networks and the Multiple Manifold Problem." And again, this really comes from trying to think a bit about about deep learning. And so, for me, um, as a kind of part-time applied mathematician, when I started to, to interact with this area, my question was really, what are the mathematical model problems in deep learning, right? In applied math, in mathematical engineering and related disciplines, we like to think in terms of model problems. We say, okay, I have a linear equation. I have a sparse vector. I want to find that thing. And then, you know, several communities think together about about that model problem, 
And you get this sort of really nice development of theory, computational methods, you know, statistical analyses, and you know, you end up with a very like nice and comprehensive package. So in in applied math, that's in in great regard how we like to work. We kind of like to identify a model problem and then tunnel down on it. And one reason why we like this way of approaching um, phenomena in, in computation is that we learn a lot through the process. So for those of you who have worked in sparse approximation, you sort of know that there's a lot that we learn by studying a, a simple problem. You know, here are things like the importance of data and problem structure, if the data are structured, then it's important that the way that we measure the data preserve the structure. Um, it's important that we know how to compute efficiently and correctly with the structure. And so, you know, to some extent, it ends up being all about structure and data. Okay. Um, now, this area of deep learning, at least on the surface, is very different. Right. If a lot of our classical areas of applied math are really model and problem driven, this is an area that's very much data driven. Right. The dominant methodology is that I get a data set or a sequence of data sets. And then I sort of look at what I have to do to to fit those data sets better. And by and large, that boils down to finding. Better and better ways to sort of cleverly shove more data through more computational resources, right? This area of deep learning, at least in industrial practice, is really scaling driven, right? I get really, really big architectures that can eat a lot of stuff. And then if I have problems with complicated statistical structure, well, I'm going to do hopefully better and better. Um, now, maybe it's a little bit disturbing what I have to pay for that performance resource-wise, whether in terms of the data resource, the computational resource, the energy resource, but at least this is a lever that one can use to improve performance. And so for those of us who are theorists by training, you know, we may look a little bit askance at this and say, well, you know, okay, the performance is getting better, but what are we truly learning? But in truth, we're learning a lot. So if we look at the area of deep learning, there are some core insights that really seem to be essential to getting systems to work. These are things like deep architectures tend to be better than shallow ones. Things like, you know, just like in some of our maybe more comfortable and familiar problems, we need to preserve the structure. Here again, we need to preserve the structure of data as it propagates through our, through our neural network. And then other phenomena that maybe we don't understand quite as well. Things like big networks tend to generalize far better than one would expect based on classical statistical theory. So, you know, this area of, um, of deep learning is one where folks are doing interesting things and, and learning things that are intellectually interesting. And so then the question is, you know, for those of us who would like to understand our problems mathematically, develop some mathematical theory, well, what is it that we're really trying to provide here? Right. What what is the role of um, applied math in in deep learning? And so this is just a personal perspective on it. Um, just a couple of topics that I think are really hard to address with data sets alone. Um, one is this issue, what I'll call uniformity, which is if I'm in an image classification scenario. So I want to classify this pen versus this pen and the pens can move around. I'd really like it to be true that my architecture makes the right decision for every pose of the pen, not just the ones that I've seen before and not just most of them. So I sort of want a for all statement. Um, and I think often in engineering, this is what we're looking for when we talk about performance guarantees. We want a for all statement that's gonna work for all things in a certain class. Okay, so that seems to require some sort of analytical reasoning. Likewise, if I want to talk about robustness, you know, I want to make sure that it's not the case that somebody can make some imperceptible perturbation to my image and have it classified as something completely different. Well, this is really, again, a for all statement, right? It says that um, for any perturbation of the data, we will do the correct thing. So, you know, again, this seems to require some sort of analytical reasoning. And then finally, um, when we talk about 
learning problems that come from science and engineering, there's this sort of recurring theme of how does the structure of the data and structure of the problem influence what I need to do to learn correctly, right? Data in science and engineering tend to be structured, and we really want to know how that structure influences the, the solution. Um, and this is something that if we only think in terms of data sets and performance on particular data sets, we really miss. We sort of miss how does the property of the data set influence the resources that are required to solve the problem. And so as um, you know, Tim and Sam and Dar and I sort of thought about this problem space, um, we really zeroed in on this, this question of data structure. And in this talk, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about an attempt to wrestle with how the data structure influences when and how we can learn a good deep neural network from data. And the specific structure that I'm going to, to, to look at is low dimensional manifold structure. So I'm going to imagine that our data are near some low dimensional subset of a high dimensional space. And I'm going to ask, well, okay, when can we learn correctly over this data? Okay. And so we really have uh, two, two motivations for thinking about low dimensional manifold structure. Um, the first one comes from computer vision and you know, more generally from signal processing. So in vision, um, visual data are challenging. You know, if you've ever worked on any instance of image classification, you, you know this, especially if you've tried to build a system that works in unconstrained conditions, works outside of the data set. Um, visual data are hard. And in most industrial vision tasks, there are really two sources of that hardness. One is a kind of statistical variability in the data, right? On the slide, we sort of see many examples of what a dog could look like, right? There are many different types of dogs. So if I'm out to build a, a dog detector or a dog classifier, I definitely need to cope with that statistical variability. And this is something that deep learning is very good at, right? We're able to build and train large architectures with many, many parameters. These can ingest a lot of training data and you know, maybe they can do to some extent the, the job of coping with the statistical, statistical variation. Another type of variation that deep networks may also be good at handling, although maybe to some extent that remains to be seen, is this kind of geometric variation that envision occurs due to the, the nuisances in the data. In the example that I gave earlier of classifying pictures of this pen versus this pen, one major nuisance, nuisance is simply the fact that these objects are moving around, right? So if I think about images as data points in a high dimensional data space, this motion cuts out a low dimensional sub manifold of that data space. So that's kind of a structured component. And so in, in this talk, um, at least for the, the mathematical part of it, we're not trying to prove a result that says that deep networks will solve any problem or will handle any data set. We're really zeroing in on this geometric structure and asking, okay, what do we need to do to handle the geometry of the data? Now, a second motivation for this um, that should, I think, be, be in common with many folks on the call here is that often when we look at learning problems that come from science, come from engineering, you know, data have some dynamics under the hood, then those data sets tend to be structured. Maybe there's a lot of noise, maybe there are, there are nuisances, you know, just as in the, in the vision problem, but there's also an underlying physical structure, right? A kind of physical simplicity that comes because the processes that generated our data are structured and maybe in some sense are simple. Um, this is kind of an, ex on the slide is kind of an extreme example of this. So this is from a collaboration um, with Zabi and Zusamarka. They're, ph they're physicists at Columbia um, who work on gravitational wave astronomy. And so here we have this uh, particular signal detection problem where we're trying to detect phenomena um, in outer space corresponding to very large objects merging. These are black holes, neutron stars, um, et cetera. And so 
here in the detection problem, I see what is in essence um, an incredibly noisy version of some known family of waveforms. And those waveforms have under the hood a sort of um, physical generating process, right? There's a certain dynamical system that describes the way that these two objects merge. And what we see is kind of a, a byproduct of that. And what we would like to do here is in a large amount of noise, figure out whether one of these interesting signals is present or not. And so clearly there's a physical structure to this problem. The way that that generates structure in the data space is if I think about all possible ways of setting up one of these systems. So I imagine all possible large objects that could bang into each other. So these can be parameterized in terms of the masses of the objects, the way that they're spinning, maybe some kind of angle of incidence. And so this cuts out a d-dimensional manifold of potential waveforms that we would like to detect. Each of those waveforms corresponds to one way that this physical system could be configured. Okay. So, you know, this is just one example. I think um, many folks on the call have other examples of sort of interesting dynamical systems that they would like to compute with. Um, and the point is that often that dynamics actually cuts out very interesting structure in the data space. Okay. And so as a, a kind of math problem, we can cut out kind of a cartoon version of the last two applications that we saw where we say, okay, let's imagine that we have some data that have low dimensional structure and let's try to compute correctly in some sense with that data. So here, the, the direct motivation of this one is kind of the, the two moving pens example. I imagine that I have data that are sampled from two submanifolds of a high dimensional data space. And what I would like to do is to learn a classifier that will correctly classify new samples from those two manifolds. Okay, so pen one cuts out, you know, maybe the, the red manifold here, pen two cuts out the blue manifold. And what we would like to do is in this kind of very simple cartoon setting, learn a classifier that always works. Okay, so formally we're given some data samples. These are X1 to Xn. Uh, they're labeled, they have labels Y1 to Yn. Here we have two classes, so the labels are, a, are plus or minus. Um, and what we're trying to do is to learn a classifier. On the slide, this is F theta of X. Um, here, theta are the parameters of that classifier. That, again, puts the correct label on each of these two submanifolds. So we're gonna put a positive number on every point on the positive manifold, negative number on every point on the negative manifold. So this is sort of the model problem that we'd like to think about. Um, any questions or comments about uh, what we've had so far sort of set up with the model problem, anything like this? Yeah, so if anyone wants to ask a question, um, Orly, please ask him to unmute. Uh, uh, I see. Raise okay. your hand and we can unmute. And yeah, him. and I think it's perfectly good to have some back and forth during the talk. Like I'm happy to have any yeah. questions if anything is unclear or if folks have a, have some comment. Um, if it's hard to manage, we can also take them at the end. All right, great, yeah. If, uh, also, there's a chat. If anyone has a question, you can- Ah, it. okay, that's, that's great too. Um, I'm not monitoring it, but Joseph, maybe you can tell me uh, uh, if, if anything comes up. Okay, um, so this is, so if there are no questions, then then this is sort of the math problem that we'd like to think about for the next portion of the talk. Um, so when we think about this problem, uh, this is really, the question here is really, how does the geometry of the data influence what we need to do to compute correctly with that data? So when I talk about the geometry of the data, then I'm going to be talking about things like, the dimensions of the manifolds, maybe their curvatures. Um, so here, curvature is an extrinsic curvature. It's sort of a curvature in the ambient space. Um, 
one detail that I glossed over a bit here, here we assume that our data are L2 normalized. So they lie on a high dimensional sphere. That's mostly for technical convenience. Um, but uh, yeah, so curvature is kind of an extrinsic curvature in the sphere. Also, if I'm trying to solve a classification problem, then it probably makes a difference how near or far my data manifolds are. So sort of the separation is going to play a role here. Um, and then finally, there may be some additional geometric parameters that tell me something about how easy or difficult this particular problem instance is. Okay, so in the theoretical results that I'm going to show you here, um, we're not solving this problem in full generality. We're going to make a major restriction and we're going to make our two manifolds be two curves. So we're going to do the D equals one case. Um, and for those of you who, who work on theory, you know that this happens sometimes. You know, you, you find that you've written several, you've written many pages uh, and you've only done, done D equals one. Um, if you read the papers, there are, there's actually enough there that one can probably do higher dimensions, but here we'll focus on D equals one. Okay, so that's our big restriction for the talk. Um, so our difficulty parameters are dimension, curvature, separation. And then it turns out that when we dig into how networks fit data, it actually matters not just how curved and how separated the manifolds are, but also in some sense, how much they tend to loop back on themselves. So I can imagine that um, if my manifolds tend to be very loopy in the sense that they tend to return to the same point many, many times, that's going to be at least numerically a more difficult problem. And for those of you who are sort of optimizers or numerical analysts, the phenomenon here is basically that as there are more loops back to the same point, there are in some sense um, more correlations in the fitting problem. So the fitting problem in some sense becomes less, becomes less well conditioned when we tend to loop back to the same point, to the same point a lot. So that's sort of the high level motivation for having a parameter that captures how, how sort of loopy the manifolds are. Um, we call this parameter in our analysis a clover number. And what this is basically capturing is the number of, is the biggest number over all points of the manifold of times that I can come back to the vicinity of that point. So that's this clover number. Um, when you see it later in the results, you should think about it in, intuitively in terms of the symmetries of the data set. So I have here on the upper right of the slide two digits from the MNIST data set. Um, these are representations of those digits. Uh, this is computed by, by Tisney and Betting. Um, these are those digits under rotation. So you can see for the four, you just have one circle. But the one, there's a near symmetry. And so when I rotate it, I get things that look quite similar. So in this case, the four would have um, a clover number of one, and the one would have a clover number of two, right? So this number is really somehow capturing near symmetries in the data. Okay, and there's a formal definition, which is uh, not quite as clean, which is, which is on the slide. Okay, and these are just a, a few other examples. So in the upper left, uh, I see now there is a, a chat. Um, okay. Uh, Mohammed asks, are you assuming that the manifolds are generated by rotation, translation, et cetera, of the same images? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the imaging scenario, we are assuming something like that. So we're assuming that we have two manifolds. And in the imaging scenario, we're imagining that we get the manifolds from geometric variability. So for each sort of for each valid type of dog, I can rotate it in, in you know, any way that I want. And so in this model problem, we're imagining we just have one dog that's being rotated or translated. Um, in the gravitational wave problem, you know, here uh, it's a little bit better, better fit. Here we're sort of thinking about all physical settings of, of, of that system. But yeah, in the imaging problem, we're dealing with geometry, but we're in some sense not dealing with statistics. 
So if you wanted to do a better version of this analysis, you would also have, say, like a distribution over those base images. And then what you would want to do is not only to correctly sort of correctly generalize over the geometric component, but also over the statistical component. So yeah, it's a good question. Okay. All right. And uh, so, yeah, when we think about, again, when we think about these components, then it, you know, it matters in some sense how much we tend to loop back to, to the same point that's captured through this, uh, this clover number quantity. Okay. So, you know, again, this is sort of the problem that we would like to solve, right? We want to understand how resources, um, say how much network I need, how much data I need, how much computation I need, depend on the geometry. So just to be concrete here, in the theoretical result, we're thinking about the sort of most generic neural network that you can imagine, which is just a fully connected ReLU network. Um, here, we're imagining that our network is of constant width as you go up, so it's kind of a, a big tube. Um, and probably this, uh, this motion is a little bit misleading. Actually, we're going to imagine that that tube is pretty wide. So here, the depth is going to turn out to be an important resource for fitting. The width is also going to be an important resource for making sure that uh, things behave in a regular fashion during training. So just to put a name on it, um, the width is little n here. The number of data samples is big N. Um, again, our, our network is sort of the most generic network that you could imagine, and it's initialized in a generic way. We choose the initial weights, IID N of zero, two over N. Um, the, the two is a standard thing in the field because if you have a nonlinearity that throws away half of the things, you need to, you need to compensate for that. And it turns out that with that variance, actually, then you do have stable propagation of features up the network. So that's sort of the one that makes things propagate stably and makes things train stably. Okay, so this is our setup, you know, just kind of generic neural network, um, constant width, n. Um, and so our resources in this problem, statistical and computational, are the depth, l, the width, little n, and the number of data samples, big N. And the kind of stylized theory question that one can ask is, well, okay, how does depth width the number of samples depend on geometry, dimension, curvature, separation, clover number, um, et cetera? Okay, and so this is a kind of multifaceted question because we have to think about the architecture, we have to think about the training algorithm, we have to think about sufficiency of the data. Um, it turns, out, it turns out that this question is essentially a question about optimization, right? Because eventually what we're going to do is we're going to fit the network on data and we're going to examine the thing that we, we fit. So eventually this is a question at some level about what gradient descent converges to. So uh, in this work, we're going to study a kind of generic optimization formulation for this problem. So here, this is a kind of, although we started out with a classification problem, this is actually a regression formulation. We're going to minimize a loss, which is basically averaging over the data, over the observed data, the squared difference between the network output and the label. So here, X is my data point, Y is my label, and I want to, to, to fit the labels. And so so then the question is, well, okay, um, does gradient descent work here, right? We're going to throw gradient descent at, at this problem, and we hope that it succeeds. Okay. And, you know, as, um, as optimizers or maybe as numerical analysts, we usually like to think about gradient descent either in terms of convergence of the objective function or convergence of the iterates, right? So we kind of like to think in the parameter space and say, I'm going to make sure that I go to the right point in the parameter space. And this is an approach that's pretty fruitful in problems that are sort of 
simple and well-structured, problems where we can actually reason about the geometry in the parameter space. This deep learning problem tends to be a little bit challenging to reason about in weight space. And the, the conceptual reason for that is when I go to fit a deep network, there are actually a lot of ambiguities in the definition of my network. For example, if I think about the features at the first layer, so that's corresponding to this first collection of little circles here. If I reorder those features, I get exactly the same network. So at least in this optimization problem, there's a permutation ambiguity at every layer. And so that means that when we go to reason in the weight space, um, at least with the tools that we have right now, it's a little bit hard to reason that those weights go to the right place because there are many, many different right places. And so what people in, in this area tend to do is instead to reason in terms of the input output space. So rather than arguing that we learn the correct weights, people like to argue that you learn the correct function. So I'm gonna kind of treat my network as a big soup of random stuff that exists to realize an input output relationship. And I'm going to ask whether during training that soup evolves in such a way that I get the right input output relationship. Now I'll say, um, just as an aside, uh, since my student Tim is here on the, on the, the talk. Um, so Tim actually has a lot of ideas for how to use these tools to reason about weight space. So, um, if, if folks are sort of interested in that aspect of the problem, he's again a, a good person to talk to um, or you know interact with in other ways. Uh, so maybe it actually is possible to go beyond this perspective. But at least for, for this talk, um, we're going to think in terms of the input-output relation. And then when we think about the input-output relation, there's a really natural object that arises that people in deep learning call the neural tangent kernel. Um, this is something that we learned about from this paper of Jaco et al. Um, and this thing basically governs how that input-output relationship evolves. So there's a definition of this thing on the slide. So it's the function that eats two x's, so theta x, x prime, um, and spits out a number. So here, x and x prime are data points, and this neural tangent kernel is the inner product of the Jacobian of the network output with respect to parameters at X and the network output with respect to parameters at X prime. And so what that tells you um, at an intuitive level is something about how easy or hard it is to independently adjust the network output at points X and X prime. So if theta X, X prime is big, then I'm going to, then it's going to be hard for me to simultaneously make the network do different things on X and X prime. If theta X, X prime is small, then in some sense, X and X prime train independently. So that's what the entries of this thing are sort of, are sort of capturing. So, you know, intuitively, um, if we had our choice over our choice of network architectures, we would like theta x, x prime to be big when we put in x and x, right? We want to have, we want it to be easy to adjust the network output on x. And we want it to be small when we put in two distinct points, x and x prime, right? We want them to be able to train differently. Okay, so that's kind of some intuition for this object. Now, this object actually has a really natural um, connection to, to training and to the behavior of gradient descent. And that's that if I think about gradient descent, and here gradient descent is going to be a kind of gradient flow where I imagine that my parameters evolve in a continuous way. But in the paper, this is sort of all finite and, and implementable and such. If I think about gradient descent on the subjective function, then it turns out if I ask myself how the fitting error evolves, so here on the slide, zeta is network output minus label, right? That's the thing whose square we want to minimize. If I think about how zeta evolves over time, 
during, during fitting, it turns out that the time derivative of zeta is actually my current zeta multiplied by this kernel, theta xx prime, and then integrated over x. So I actually have, in terms of this thing, this kind of simple differential equation for the error. If I think about my, my kernel as an operator, then to get the change in the error, I'm just going to push the current error through, through that thing and multiply by negative one. And so if I, if I want, if I think about this big theta as kind of a big matrix, right? Like it's an operator that takes a function to a function, kind of think about it as a big matrix, then I'm going to expect to have rapid decrease in the error if my current error is aligned with the eigenvectors of that matrix that correspond to big eigenvalues, right? I want theta times zeta to be big. That's gonna make the error decrease fast. So when we think about whether we do a good job of fitting here, whether optimization does a good job, this is going to be largely about the alignment of the error zeta with this kernel theta. We want zeta to be sort of on the eigenspace of the kernel that corresponds to big eigenvalues. And so if we come back to this kind of entry-wise perspective where this theta is capturing um, to what extent different points tend to go together, then what we can say is if theta of x, x prime is small for distinct x and x prime, it's almost like this theta operator is acting like a diagonal matrix, right? We kind of want the off diagonal to be small, right? Because, um, you know, if the off diagonal is, is small, then we won't have small eigenvalues and, and we'll have fast fitting. Okay, and in truth, um, this theta is a function of this sort of continuous variable x and x prime. It has eigenvalues that are arbitrarily small. And so when you go to reason about this, a lot of the reasoning is to argue that those sort of don't hurt you. Okay, so, so this is just um, one bit of technology here, this kind of kernel and um, dynamical system that allows us to reason about fitting in input-output space. Now, when we look into this thing, this sort of leaves us with two mathematical tasks. And uh, these mathematical tasks are a little bit beyond the scope of, of the talk. You know, we're not going to do them here, but we're going to pull out a few intuitions for them from them about how fitting works in these kinds of networks. And the, the tasks are basically again, to argue that this is a problem that this network is good at fitting. Formally, that means argue that the initial fitting error is close to the eigenvectors of the, the eigenvectors of the, the lead eigenvectors of this kernel. And then second is that um, in this problem, I have my random initialization, right? I rolled the dice and got, you know, some instance of the, of the network. Um, and my random sample data. And so I'm going to have to have to argue that those two sources of randomness don't hurt me, right? That the behavior is sufficiently regular that we get to a good solution. Okay, so maybe before talking a little bit about those two issues, um, any questions about this as an, uh, as an approach? So, Questions or sort of comments about what we're after here. Obviously, it's a little bit, it's a it's sort of a little bit sketchy and high level, but you know, I think the point is if you're not working on these problems, the, the point is that actually there are certain regimes of of training where um I can actually reason about the fitting of my neural network by reasoning about things that are a lot more friendly, right? Reasoning about some kind of linear differential equation, reasoning about linear operators, which is, you know, basically matrices. Okay. So, so Zach, uh, sorry for interrupting, John. So no, please. From the That's chat great. has a question. Um, yeah, okay. 
Uh, ah, is it, Zachary asks, is that theta matrix symmetric is, generally? Is it, is it uh, symmetric generally? Yeah, that's good. So um, the theta is symmetric and you can kind of see it from, um, from the formula on the slide in the sense that if I interchange X and X prime, I get the same number. Um, formally, uh, this is a, a positive definite kernel. So, you know, it's sort of the infinite dimensional generalization of a positive definite matrix. And so that means that I can think about it. That's why I can sort of think about it like a big matrix. And because it's symmetric, I can think about it in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So when I go, when I think about this dynamical system, I can almost imagine that I've diagonalized it. Um, ah, Stuart asks, does anything prevent some eigenvalues from being negative so that the network diverges? How about complex eigen? Okay, so it's symmetric. Uh, and Nathan also, or somebody in Nathan's room also has a question. Um, so uh, good. So, uh, so Stuart asks, does anything prevent eigenvalues from being negative or complex eigenvalues? So all the eigenvalues are real because it's symmetric. And actually, all of the eigenvalues are non-negative. Um, and the reason that they're non-negative is actually because in this definition, this thing is kind of like an inner product between two features, right? So whenever I ha whenever I sort of take my data, pop it up into a different space, and then take an inner product, the resulting kernel is is um, is positive definite. Or non the matrix is positive semi-definite. And actually, I, I think I don't have a perfect picture for this on the slide. Well, actually, I can, I'll show in a second what this kernel looks like. Um, but it turns out, for those of you who like sort of harmonic analysis, the eigenvectors of this kernel end up being oscillatory functions. For example, if your data are uniform on a sphere, the eigenvectors of this thing are spherical harmonics. They're like the, the Fourier basis on the sphere. And if your data are over manifolds, then the eigenvectors look, they aren't formally, I think, it would be amazing if this were true, but they, they aren't formally um, the eigenvectors of the, the Laplacian over the manifold, but they have a little bit of that feel. They're like graded by how much they oscillate. Big eigenvalues correspond to eigenvectors that don't oscillate as much. Um, and so they, they sort of act like an analog of the Fourier basis. Okay, and I see there's a question from uh, from from Nathan's room so, back there. Yeah, uh, you were saying that uh, you, you take the time derivative of the sign error, right? Yeah, and you were assuming that you can extrapolate the um, discrete data into continuum data in this case, right? Um. Yeah, so so I think there are a couple of things. So I'll answer that question and Samuel's question on um, on theta depending on the parameter values because they're both they're sort of both good questions and they're actually related. Okay, so when I when I derive this equation, um, I am sort of thinking in the continuum. I'm imagining that the parameters are evolving according to a gradient flow. Um, and so, you know, the param the derivative time derivative of the parameters is the negative of the gradient of objective with respect to parameters. Now, um, very similar analysis and very similar object also works if you do constant stepping, if you do constant stepping gradient descent, you get a sort of very similar theta object that controls the behavior of the error. And actually in the paper, we do the discrete time version, but um, on the slide, I think it's easier. And actually when we were driving it, it's easier to think in the continuum. So so yeah, all of this still works for, for sort of discrete dynamics as well. Okay, and Samuel asks a, a, a really good question, um, uh, which is, it looks like the theta depends on the parameter values. How do you control how do you control for this as the network evolves? Okay, so that's an excellent question. The theta does depend on the parameter values because theta is generated by the network Jacobian at my current parameters. Okay, and so there's an observation. So there are two answers to this. Um, 
there, there's an observation um, that sort of drives all of these analyses, which is that if I have a wide network, then I can get a lot of work done in terms of improving my input-output relationship before this theta object changes too much. So in the analysis in, in the papers that I'm alluding to here, what we say is we're going to analyze a kind of nominal theta, which is the theta of the expected network at initialization. So we're gonna imagine we're at random initialization and we're gonna imagine that we've somehow accounted for whatever probabilistic fluctuations due to the random, random weights. And we're gonna think about that object. And that object turns out to be simple, turns out to be one that we can, we can reason about analytically. Now, then that object is only controlling the evolution of the error at initialization. Um, and so if I train my network for a long time, that, that object will no longer be predictive of how the error evolves. On the other hand, it turns out that if my network is wide, then I can get a lot of training done before that theta changes too much from initialization. And so that's kind of a trick that's played here. Um, and it's also played in other analyses in, in, in this area is to basically make the network wide enough that it's almost like this, um, this linear constant coefficient uh, differential equation is dictating the evolution during training. Basically, get enough, get work done before theta changes too much. So that's what's in the paper, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, now, that is both good and bad. The good is that uh, um, the the good is that we can prove theorems with that, um, and it's hard to prove theorems about deep learning. The bad is that you have to make the width big to do that. Um, and so in some of the initial uh, papers introducing this object, the width was actually infinite. You just make the network infinitely wide. Um, through quite a bit of um, sort of technical heroism by the students, um, we managed to get it down to a polynomial in the depth, which for theory is like is like a little bit is is non-trivial. That wasn't easy. On the other hand, our the networks that we work with in practice don't have width depth to the say 99, right? They have, you know, maybe depth to the three or something like something like this. So there is something lost when you make the network wide and you try to make this thing stay constant. Um and there, I'll, I'll just say that um, I'm going to put Tim on the, the, the hook for this. Uh, my student, Tim, has some, uh, some really great ideas about how to, to cope with that. In particular, there are ways of sort of using this initial dynamics to sort of bootstrap some ideas about how the weights and the theta evolve that are accurate over longer time scales. And I think the reason that I mentioned that, you know, because I think this is an, an institute seminar and eventually we would really like to be collaborating is that um, some of the work that Tim's doing on that right now looks promising both for improving the width dependency and for saying more about what the network actually learns, which I think is actually kind of the interesting part when you're sort of, trying to learn with structured data. You know, you'd like to, you'd like to know not only that it learns and have a guarantee for that, but know what and how it learns. So I, I think the the answer one is make the network wide and then this theta is close to constant. Answer two is that um maybe stay tuned because you can there there are some ways apparently of um inducing some control over longer time scales. Okay, but uh, yeah, thanks. It's a it's a great question. <laughs> okay, and and Tim is in the chat as well. Um, okay. 
All right, so, so this is sort of the, the feeling of the analysis. Um, so I won't go into too many details on the actual, uh, the actual mathematics, but just to give you a sense. So um, just to give you a sense of how sort of things play here. So what's on the slide here is a visualization of this theta xx prime as a function of x and x prime. So here I have fixed x, that's the point in the middle corresponding to the top of this little, little hat here. And then the height of the hat and also its color is um, the, the neural tangent kernel theta x, x prime as a function of x prime. So what you can see is that it decays as x prime gets further away. So there's a kind of localization in this, in this kernel. And remember here, a kernel close to diagonal is good for us, right? We kind of want it to be localized because that means that we can fit complicated functions. And so it turns out that because of the way that features propagate in deep networks, if I make my network deeper, I actually make this kernel sharper. So you can see as we go from depth five to depth 50, it's going from, you know, kind of like so to something that's very concentrated about the middle point. And if I kept going, it gets, it gets arbitrarily concentrated. Um, and so this is really down to the way that features propagate in a deep network. As I learn, as I, um, as I make my network deeper, this kernel gets sharper. That means we can fit more complicated things. And so the sort of conceptual scheme here is I have my geometry. I'm going to make my network deep enough to fit the geometry. So I'm going to set the depth based on, say, that curvature separation um, maybe this clover number that we mentioned earlier. Um, the way I actually do it is using a little bit of harmonic analysis. Um, so for those of you who, who like signal processing, actually there's a lot of Fourier analysis in here. Um, the reason is that this, uh, this kernel actually over the ambient space is a function of angle only. So this is almost acting like a shift invariant or rotationally invariant kernel. And that, so that's kind of a natural domain for, for Fourier analysis. Um, now, the problem here is that we're trying to do this over the manifolds themselves rather than the ambient space. And so the, the sort of technical trick is to localize it enough and then approximate it with something that's intrinsic to the manifold. Okay, and so beyond the scope, how that actually how that actually works, but the point is, if you do that, then you can figure out how deep the network needs to be relative to the geometry of the data to ensure that gradient descent is going to do a good job. And then the remaining task is basically to make sure that um, you know here we did this for a kind of nominal kernel. We did this for an expectation over the initial random network. Now we need to make sure that the actual network acts like that, that random network. And so here, um, the main idea is to think about how information propagates through the network. So if I think about my network, my initial network as having random weights at each layer, this generates this kind of sequential random process my features start at the bottom and then they propagate up. Um, and so, you know, if you like probability, martingale tools are, are really effective here because again, you have some more randomness at each step. Um, and, you know, this is another place where I think there could be good connections to say, unsupervised learning, model discovery, things like this, that if you dig under the hood of the paper, there's some tight control of how those features propagate and then eventually of how they how they evolve. Um, and so that's sort of the, the engine that's driving this. Um, and for those of you who are really, really theorists, there's like a, there's like a bit of that that's sharp. Most of this is not sharp at all, but there's a bit that's sharp. So if you like if you really care about the math of deep networks, then um, there's there are a few sort of uh, sharp estimates in there that may be applicable in other places. But the high level intuition again is that we sort of um, we want to set the network deep enough to fit the to fit the geometry, 
then we want to make sure that the network is wide enough that the behavior of gradient descent kind of as a random process is, is regular. That's sort of captured here. Then when we wanna talk about generalization, this is really kind of pointing in the opposite direction from fitting. For fitting, I want to be able to, to adjust network outputs at different points independently. For generalization, I want network outputs at different points to kind of go together. And so for generalization, the amount of data that we need is more or less set by the width of this kernel, sort of its aperture. So if I think about this as this kind of pointy hat here, then it's really the width of the hat that tells me how densely my manifolds need to be covered in order to generalize. Okay, so those are like three quick intuitions about how this works. When you put it all together, you get a result that says that, okay, indeed, I can solve this uh, particular problem. I can do it when my network is deep enough relative to the geometry and when my network is wide enough and I've seen enough data. Um, the sort of, I, I think probably the, the thing that is maybe most interesting here is sort of the problem formulation and some of the technical tools. Um, if we want to think about this as a, as a theorem and sort of contrast it with, with things that are out there, um, the novelty is that this is a gener generalization guarantee for data that could be non-separable and that it pertains to a deep network. So that's sort of the, in, in that literature, that's the, the bit that's different. Um, but this is sort of our, our main theoretical result. And I can see actually we only have three minutes to finish the talk. So I won't stop and ask for questions here. Rather, I think we can um, just briefly show a few more pictures that could be a good lead into the Q&A. Um, so this, is, this first part of the talk has really been about theory, sort of proving that in certain situations, a generic network can fit structured data. But of course, it's um, maybe even more interesting to ask, how do I build the structure of the data into the network? So this is a, a question that we've been looking at in the context of astronomy, in the context of vision, um, et cetera, sort of looking at network architectures that are inspired, maybe inspired to some extent by conventional techniques, but are also flexible and data-driven. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of main benefit, potential benefit of that is that if I can have an architecture which is flexible and which builds in the physics that I, I know will be present, actually I'm going to do much better in terms of learning from uh, an available data set, right? You can sort of argue heuristically and in some situations show that, you know, if I don't know that the object moves, I need exponential in the dimension of the transformation groups samples in order to learn that. And so wouldn't it be better if we focus that statistical resource on the things that we don't know ahead of time? And so we've been looking at architectures that sort of build some prior knowledge about the structure of the this, um, this, uh, this structured sort of low dimensional data into the architecture. One interesting way of doing it is actually through what's known as unrolled optimization, where the network layers actually have an interpretation as iterations of an optimization method. Okay, so that last bit was a mouthful. I think really that's to some extent um, pointing to some interesting directions for collaboration or maybe for future work um, is really around building geometry into networks. Then at a more technical level, it's um, getting beyond these short training times, uh, making predictions about what is learned. And again, I think um, it would be really fascinating to think about um, whether some of these tools could be helpful for other types of learning problems with low dimensional structure, because you know they seem to be all over the place. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention and for your, your interaction during the talk. Um, and I think if there's time, we can, we can take questions. Thank you. Thank you, John, for this great talk. Um, so yeah, let's uh, open the floor for questions. Um, anyone, you can write the chat.
Okay. I see there's another question from Samuel. Uh, so maybe yep. maybe we can start with that while yes. folks are, are thinking of them. Um, so Samuel asks, in some sense, does this mean that I could build a kernel that looks like the, the neural tangent kernel and do everything with a kernel method rather than a deep neural net? Um, I, yeah, that's a really that's a really good question because um, we've sort of summarized the dynamics of the the neural network through this neural tangent kernel, and um, then you asked a great question about like time variation of the kernel, and we said that in this result we made the network wide enough that we didn't have to worry about that too much. So for this result, I completely I completely agree. It's not quite there formally, but I think it wouldn't be too hard for someone to get the same result for a kernel method. Um, and you know, you could you could like build a kernel method that uses the neural tangent kernel, um, and it would achieve those results. Now, those results don't capture everything that a neural network does with this data set. And I think that's where a lot of the, the sort of interesting questions are. Because in a neural network, which is not super wide, more interesting types of learning occur. That kernel actually changes with time. Um, a lot of the work that, you know, that Tim and some of my other students have been doing recently is trying to understand how it changes. And so you can think about neural network fitting as you sort of start with that kernel method, but then you're also adapting the kernel. And then, you know, if, if for, for people who really think in sort of learning theory terms, then you could ask, well, is there some separation between what the, the learned kernel can do versus the fixed kernel? Um, for us, I think we're more interested in, well, what is learned, right? Like how does it adapt to the data set? And also concretely, it would really be nice if instead of depth to the 99, we add depth to the three because depth to the three is, you know, more like what happens in what happens in practice and it's more practically relevant. So understanding training beyond kernel regime also sort of helps technically for improving, um, improving things like sample complexity and network complexity and the theoretical results. So great, very good questions. Um, I wonder, do we have other questions? I also don't know, do we have a, do we have a time limit here? Um, I'm happy to keep answering questions and keep discussing, but I think it's mainly up to you. Um, so okay. I, I have, I have a question. Uh, so normally with, when we train deep networks, we yeah. add, uh, regularization. So yes. do you have any insight as to like when you use a kernel method, uh, how, how does that regularization affect your dynamics? And, um, yeah, that's that's good. And I think it's hard to answer in general because there are so many different regularization methods out there. I think some kind of generic things like say weight decay. So weight decay is I just put an I just put an L2, you know, a, a squared L2 penalty on all of the weights. Um so we haven't proved anything about this with weight decay. So I I maybe there's a slight danger of saying a wrong thing here, but I, I think from the perspective of this analysis, almost nothing changes. Um, you might be able, that's interesting, you might be able to pull out a slight benefit in like how long you keep control after the initial, after the sort of start of training. Um, so there might be a benefit that could be obtained there. We haven't done the analysis, but my feeling is that for a generic regularizer like weight decay, then not much changes. Now, there are other regularizers though. And I think one interesting question is what kind of regularization would be helpful given that we expect that our data have structure? Are there forms of regularization that can actually sort of improve the fitting, improve the generalization? Um, we haven't answered that uh, in any way in the context of this work. Um, we do have some other work. Um, so in particular, there's a, a paper that's joint with uh, EMA's group from Berkeley that's sort of looking at 
this idea of unrolled optimization with specific costs that are motivated by a low dimensional structure. So you sort of set up your network as seeking low dimensionality. Um, that has a little bit of a, a little bit of the feel of, I think the more sort of the sort of more interesting side of regularization here. And then there's like also, there's also maybe a third form of regularization that could be interesting, which is sparsifying regularization, either on the weights or the features. That again is pretty closely tied to this question of what we what we actually learn during training, because when we seek to sparsify the features, for example, then often this this makes us a little bit at least in my opinion and experience, this makes us a little bit more sharply able to identify relevant sort of relevant patterns in the visual data. Um, this, I, I think, requires an analysis in, I, I think probably requires an analysis in feature space, or sorry, in weight space to understand. Um, and we have a, a little bit of work, old work that, in some sense, tries to do a, a version of that analysis for a shallow model. So this is looking at um, sparse dictionary models. And so there, you know, you have like a sort of just a, a product of two things that you're trying to learn. You put sparse regularization on one. And actually in that context, you can map out geometry uh, in, in weight space. So I guess what I would say is for things like weight decay, it shouldn't change very much. Maybe it could help a little bit if one sort of uh, accounted for it carefully. But what's really interesting is can you regularize in a way that forces features to learn better? And can you regularize with the structure in mind? Yep. Uh, so nice. yeah, good. Thanks. Great. Uh, if you have a moment, uh... Yeah, First, sure. thanks. Thanks. Great. Uh, very, very clear talk. Um, Thank you. The uh, just a curiosity. You had your little pointy hats that were talking about sort yep. of the bandedness. Uh, what what was the little hemispheres below them uh, representing? Ah, OK. Yeah. Just uh, explain the graphic. So our data are on the sphere. Um, so this is the, the these pictures were done by my former student, Sam Buchanan, um, who yeah, he did an, an amazing job with the art here. So this is actually the neural tangent kernel. Um, and, and what's down below is sort of actually a data set on the sphere. So that's the sphere. The red and the blue are um, the, the two manifolds. And then the, the kernel is actually plotted as a height above this representation of the tangent space. Um, so that's sort of what's going on in that picture. Got it. Cool. Um, um, thank you. Sure. Thanks. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we can conclude. Uh, thank you very much again, John. It was a great talk. And we hopefully look forward to talking about this more in the future. Um, so we're going to conclude uh, the talks for, I think, next week or the week after. Send an email. And thank you all for being here. And have a great weekend. Thanks, right. John. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys.